Hello and welcome back, my friend, to the last part of course. Now, uh, after this part where we're going to talk about pen testing in industrial control environments, uh, there is going to be a part 11, uh, which is going to go through the review questions. So there's 10 review questions for each of the 10 chapters, just to kind of throw that out there so you're aware. But uh, as far as course content, this is the last part. So let's go ahead and jump right in. We're, this section we're going to be talking about, like I mentioned, uh, penetration testing. Right? How do we, with permission, break into control system environments? Of course, there's always the conversation of how do we do this safely? That's definitely a big part of uh, the initial part of this, this conversation and, and this part. Uh, for some of you that have been you know, watching my LinkedIn content, you know, one of the things I was always fascinated on in IT was always how do attackers break into systems. And that's how, what got me into penetration testing and learning you know, how do attackers break in so I could become a better defender. The same thing holds true in OT, even so much so, or even so much so because OT environments typically tend to be more you know, smaller in size and scope than we see traditional IT environments, usually. When I was in IT, there used to be this bumper sticker somebody had, and then it ended up on shirts, and you would see it everywhere, but it would say, I read your email. And I think it was more of the kind of the sneaky system or email administrator on the system you know, doing that, getting in your inbox and reading your, your email. I always thought about what if it was the attacker that took the effort to break into the system to then read your email, which we see a lot of attackers, of course, do these days. So I took that and I turned it around a little bit just to reflect more of the ICS or the OT world. So you see, I like I hacked your power plant, and that's kind of the 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 font that 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 sticker had appeared in. So I for me, I I kind of I like it, and it actually showed up on our B-Sides Greenville shirts this year. It's actually on my license plate. Um, I bring it up because, for me, it's part of a awareness effort, really, when you think about that power plants and other OT or control system or critical infrastructure environments can be broken into they can be hacked and we're seeing that with the compromises today and over the last couple of months let alone the last couple of years so i did add an extra disclaimer in this and, and we're not this is and I've, I've taught penetration testing from an it perspective many many times in, in the past and i've talked a lot in, in the of penetration testing and control system networks but you know, one of the things we have to remember is that any penetration testing right, that we're doing, we have to have authorization from the appropriate party, really the owner, the asset owner, to, to get that authorization. Uh, otherwise, you know, we're breaking the law. I've, I've even done penetration testing in the past where I got uh, permission from, uh, like the, let's say, the IT manager, and the owner wasn't aware. They weren't very happy. I still should have been, you know, I was covered in, in that case. But, but make sure you get the permission from the appropriate people that actually can give you that authorization to do the to do the testing. Again, otherwise, you're you're breaking the law, and then you're just another attacker. So make sure to have authorization before you do any testing, unless you're doing this testing, of course, in your own lab. So what we're going to cover in this section, this looks really light, <laughs> but <laughs> we're going to say we're going to talk about a couple of books that uh, I suggest uh, for reference. We'll talk a little bit more about things like authorization and legal consequences and ethical considerations and and talk about you know, how we're able to you know, focus our efforts in a penetration test along with, you know, what's the client really looking for? Are they even looking for a penetration test? Because prob probably not, honestly. Uh, so we'll have those conversations. Then there's only about 80 slides on the ICSOT penetration testing methodology um, that I have put together based off the MITRE attack framework for ICS. Because I think it's a it's a great, for me, I think I love the way it's laid out. Or 
I should say, not necessarily how they laid it out exactly, but I tweaked it a little bit and I really like it now. And I think it it helps make sense of you know, answering those questions, right? How do attackers break in to control system environments? And again, I think it's the way it flows will help, I hope. Let me know. Give me your feedback. So let's jump right in, though. So there are a couple of books out there. There's not a ton right, out there. Uh, my favorite still by far is the Hacking Exposed uh, book for industrial control systems. I was a big fan of the Hacking Exposed series. Uh, previously, I had every book that they ever came out with. Uh, and when they came out with industrial control systems, I was there. Um, I've... I've been very fortunate to meet a couple of the authors and consider some of them friends now. And when you look at, uh, this book is still about, I think, seven years old at this point, maybe almost eight, but still very, very relevant. And it is a great basis for you know starting to understand how to pen test control system environments. Now, there's also a newer book. I think this is only about a year or maybe two years at, at this point. Is pen, pen Testing Industrial Control Systems by Paul Smith. So I picked this one up not you know a couple months ago, not, not long ago, to see what was in it. And I really liked where he was headed uh, with it. Uh, he uses the uh, Click PLC uh, as the, the main uh, target. In, in the environment and learning and helping people understand things like PLC programming. So like half the book was kind of this getting an understanding of control system environments, right? Some Something like what we're talking about in this course. Um, and then I like his idea of building out, helping people build out a virtualized control system network for being able to test across you know, multiple layers. And that's not something you, it's always easy to do. Um, just have a lot of memory in your machine. So I don't know how effective that is for, for more people. I need to spend more time with the book and, and walk through some of the things. But I think there's still a lot of great content in there. So I'm not trying to say anything bad about it. I think it's still a, a really good book um, for people to check out, especially if you are interested in, in pen testing and control system environments. So uh, again, there, when we ever have a conversation around penetration testing, right, this is us as the good people, right, trying to help going into an environment to identify issues so we can help the client understand where those gaps are so that they can address them. Again, like we mentioned earlier, we have to have permission from the appropriate parties within the organization before we start scanning away if that's what we're going to do or launching attacks or trying to move from the IT network into the IT OT DMZ and then into the, the OT network. And then how do we move laterally throughout the OT network between zones and et cetera, et cetera. But you know, we have to have authorization to do that. We have to understand the scope or, you know, do we even have permission to do all of those things? Probably not, right? The, we're always worried or concerned with how are we going to affect availability or uptime of the environment. So maybe we could test against the ITOT DMC from IT. Maybe maybe that's it. And that's the most common scenario you see in ICS OT pen testing, unless there's there's a lab environment or some type of you know backup site that you can test against. So can we look at, there's always that concern that we don't want to have any availability issues, right? So how do we do that safely? That's why we're mentioning a lot of pen tests today. And this is like, I you know, know quite a few pen testers that and that's all they do is industrial control pen testing for, for a lot of companies like Dragos and, and Honeywell and, and some of the other large integrators and, and vendors. And right, it's, it's a lot of it's either in a lab environment, so you're not impacting the availability of a production plant, or maybe you're a, a testing, maybe I, can I break into the ITOT DMZ from IT, right? That's going to be the most common path an attacker is going to, to take. So can we identify any gaps there? Right. Now, we want to also keep in mind that as we're going through and doing testing and we're taking notes and I like to, when I'm doing testing, I'm taking a lot of notes. I'm practically writing the report as I go along because I hate writing the report at the end, probably like most people. So I try to do as much as I go along. So it's not as painful, <laughs> painful in the end. But as 
imagine we're finding vulnerabilities and ways to break into the environment and we have it in a Word document or maybe a little notepad text file that what if somebody, what if an attacker gained access to that information? That's why we see attackers go after penetration testing companies. Right? They want that information. Because as a penetration tester, you're finding ways to break into different environments. So if I steal that information, then I have all the information I need on how to break into those environments. So you're doing all the work for me. I just have to break into your system to gain access to that information. So we make sure that we store that information securely. It's encrypted. Right? We're using local encryption on our laptops in case the laptop is stolen. Right? Uh, the documents should have additional encryption wrapped around them if we're storing them you know, in a different location. Right? It needs to be encrypted, 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 encrypted. You know, we mentioned uh, understanding the scope in which we're testing. This is even more so important in control system environments. It was important in IT, but even more so in control system networks. Because what if the scope is, hey, we're going to identify issues, uh, gaps, or, or vulnerabilities in the IT, OD, the IT OT DMZ from the IT network. And that's it. Now, you might, let's say, break into the IT OT DMZ. Let's say you gain access to a data historian sitting in the DMZ. And then you run something like Netstat on the machine to see all of these network connections from the OT network. And you know you know it would be just so easy to gain access to the OT network from that data historian. But you can't if it's not in scope. If you do, you violate the scope. And that's where it goes back to you don't have authorization and you could be potentially, I mean, technically, again, you're, you're breaking the law or in worst case, you're going to really upset the customer and they're not going to have you back. So keep that in mind. So stay within the scope. I've been very tempted right? <laughs> many times, but you have to remember, stay within the scope. And then talk about being transparent with report findings. Right? When you're writing the report, when you're sharing that information, keep it very, I always like to think of just you know, relaying the facts. I don't embellish it, but I want to relay the facts and all of the facts. If a customer takes information out of your report that they don't want to see, that's on them. But make sure you include all the information in the report, even if it would mean that that client had, let's say, a regulatory finding. It's our job as penetration testers to make sure we present all of the facts, all of the findings to the client and what the client does with that. Right? We like to think that the client's going to take all of those findings and fix all of those issues. In reality, they might, they might just put the report in a drawer and not do anything with it. They just had a, maybe a regulatory requirement to say they have to have a penetration test done, not that they, they have to fix the issues. That's very common still today, unfortunately. But we're going to re Report the facts, right, as we see them. Now, we kind of take a step back because when before we even get into penetration testing and when we're talking with the client, a lot of times people reach out to me and say, hey, we'd like to have, you know, do you do pen tests? We'd like to have a pen test done. And it's like, that's awesome. I love doing pen testing. It's one of the most fun, you know, fun things in life for me to do, even especially physical penetration testing. But the idea is, you know, more than likely the the person reaching out, they just don't realize that they don't actually need a pen test. Not not at this point in their overall maturity of their cybersecurity program. Either and usually it's it's people starting out or they have an environment that's, you know, a year or two old. It's like, that's great, you want to do a pen test. But then you start asking, well, why do you want to do a pen test? And what are you trying to achieve? What are you trying to get out of it? Because most of it, it's, oh, we want you to find these issues and, and so we can be able to fix them and we can be protected against attackers, which is, again, which is all great. But 
as we're in part 10 of the course, think of everything else we've talked about through the course, like secure network architecture and complete asset registers that lead into things like network security monitoring and continuous vulnerability management. Talking with the clients, are you doing all these fundamentals today? And often it's, well, kind of, sort of, or oh, haven't even thought about that, or no, we don't have network security monitoring in place. So the idea would be, do you need a pen test? Sure, but you don't need a pen test today. You need a pen test a year or two down the road probably after you take the time to put in all of these other fundamentals in place. And again, a lot of people that do penetration testing don't like that. I've, I've had some, real, and some great people come after me for saying that. It's like, do you need a pen test? Yes. It's just down the road. And of course, if that's their business, they don't necessarily like having that. Plus, it's like you're telling them their baby's ugly. Trust me, I get it. I love doing pen testing. I love doing pen testing more than designing secure network architecture. But what's going to help address the most risk in the environment? It's the secure network architecture, not the pen test. Plus, pen testing can be very expensive for the client, which is great for us when we submit an invoice. But again, it's not an appropriate use of the client's resources as well if they're not at a maturity level, right? If they're not further down the path of their cybersecurity program for their control system network. So we have to understand, right? And it's just to be good people, right? to help them understand where they're at today and where do they need to go next. Even if maybe it's very common that let's, how about it? Let's do a maturity assessment and see where you're at today. And then, yeah, on that kind of roadmap we create from that is it's going to be doing a pen test. But again, pen test is going to be near the end, if not the very end. We want to get to all the other fundamentals first. And so that's really what we're talking about, and it's getting helping understand. I, and I know people out there will say, hey, they get a call and say, I need a pen test, and they'll be like, hey, we'll be right there. Here's a bill for eighty, ninety, hundred thousand dollars $100,000. That's, that, to me, that's just not how to conduct business or, or how to conduct ourselves because, again, we're here as cybersecurity professionals to help the client reduce risk as much as possible. So... so so as mentioned, that's that was like three quarters of that <laughs> the content slide. The rest of this part uh, again is, is like uh, eighty slides <laughs> when we talk about. So how do we break into control system environments, right? How do we pen test control system networks? Now I would say especially these days, and this only becomes more and more true every day because of IT, OT conversions, right? We're just seeing more and more Windows systems coming into OT. And then now there's even this idea of adding a cloud component, but we don't get into that in, in this module. We'll, just, uh, we'll mention it a co in a couple of places. But this idea that, you know, think of when we're coming into an OT environment at the, the higher levels, of the OT network, if we think Purdue model, that, or expanded Purdue model, so I don't get in trouble. You know, this idea is it's all Windows systems, almost always, that we're going to come across. So if we have a really strong foundation in pen testing Windows environment, we have a very, very strong foundation for pen testing and, and control system networks. Right? It allows us to move from IT to the DMZ through the IT, OT, DMZ, and then into the OT network, and then through the OT network until we get to certain points, points like, oh, PLCs and HMIs. Maybe that HMI is running Windows. But what do we do when we get to these you know, more traditional types of OT assets? That's where a lot of, we can hit that wall, and we have to, ooh, this is a whole different story. This is where we have to take our time. So we did mention in one of the previous parts of the course, we talked about the SANS ICS kill chain that you know, Michael Asante and Rob Lee and Tim Conway and others had, had put together. Remember stage one and stage two. Stage one talks about how attackers break into the IT environment. And then stage two was how do we go from IT, essentially, right, from IT into OT. And then what do we do when we're in the OT environment to accomplish our mission? 
So I thought they, again, they did a really great job. I'm not necessarily a fan of the layout per se, but and that's and that's okay. I mean, it's still incredible work. I feel even bad saying that, but I did want to kind of take a step back, right, and look at how we can map this out to a couple of different incidents that we've seen over time and how things have changed, even just over the last again the last year or so. But when we look at the Ukraine blackout the first one that we know of in, in 2015, right? Russia went in to you know, multiple power generation facilities and, and transmission facilities, right? And flip breakers to, to turn power off. They had created ICS specific malware to infect control system uh, assets. They even, you can see that even when they turned the power off, they did denial service attacks against the call center. So if people were trying to call in to report the blackout. They just kept getting busy signals and, and that was just kind of you know, the idea that it just creates more chaos. And a lot of times, right, nation state on nation state attacks just want to create chaos. But when we look at this from that stage one, stage two perspective, if using the, the SANS layout. So see, and very common Right, attackers get into the OT or sorry, attackers get into the IT environment to start using phishing. Right, we get somebody in the IT environment to click on a link, open up an attachment that infects their system, and then it'll open up that command and control channel to the internet where we have access. Right, we have hands-on access to that infected system. And then you see at this point, right, they're able to right, sit in the environment. Right. Perform reconnaissance, sit, listen, gather credentials, right? harvest you know, Active Directory for all we can. Find out how do people move from IT to OT. In this case, they found there's a VPN appliance. Well, if we're not using multi-factor authentication, then once we have usernames and passwords, we log into the VPN concentrator and boom, we're on the OT network. And that's what happened in this case. Right, so that's again that's stage one. Now in stage two, once they were in the OT network, and this is where <laughs> they're reading reading the SANS report that Michael Asante had put together on this was talking about how the Russians had got into the OT network, and one of the first things that they did was they reconfigured the on-site the UPS, the uninterruptible power supply. Not right, not a not a fancy OT term. It's just right the the battery powered backup. So that way, when they tripped, when they turned off the power, right, even all the internal systems like engineering workstations and, and monitoring stations, everything would go black. <laughs> so it was kind of just, a, I think he actually mentioned like kind of as a big F U is really what, what it came, came down to. But a lot of times, once you get into the OT environment, right, attackers or penetration testers, even though pen testers are on a much limited schedule, you might have 40 or maybe eight hours in the environment, if you're even in the OT environment at all, to do your job. Right? Nation state attackers, that's remember, they're persistent. They have the time to sit there. That's also their job. And they have the time to sit there and poke around the environment. And they probably are trying to go slow and to be stealthy so that they avoid detection in those environments that are actually doing things like network security monitoring. In the Ukraine, you can see they found where a lot of OT assets, and you still see this today, right? They didn't actually come with an ethernet connection. They have a serial connection, but we want to get to them over TCP IP. So we would install a serial to ethernet converter so that way I can connect to the converter over TCP IP and then still issue commands over the serial connection, like, like that RS-232 cable you've probably seen, right? Sometimes like if you hook up maybe like to a switch, right? You have that, that or even maybe a PLC, right? You have that serial connection from your engineering workstation to your laptop, and it goes into the, the, the switch or the PLC. Right, so I Ethernet carry, uh, cable, it's one of those serial cables we use to make that connection and, and directly interact with the, the system. And you can see they um, 
gained access to engineering workstations. They had access to, uh, from there, the HMI is to be able to flip the breakers. And there's actually a link to the YouTube video uh, in the end of the course where you actually can see a couple of the operators are sitting there at the engineering workstation that has the HMI loaded, right? They're watching the console and they're watching the mouse moving and where the, you see the attackers were trying to get to the point where they could flip the breakers and turn off the power. So it's really, you know, it's, it's, you know, of course it's a, it's a cell phone video from 2015. So it's not, <laughs> it's not the greatest video quality, uh, but it's still very fascinating to watch. It's, you know, it's watching history in the ICS cybersecurity world. So I, I do have that at the, at near the, the end of the, the part, in this part of the course. So, and then once the Russians had turned off the, the power, right, using the, the engineering workstations to access the HMIs, to flip the breakers and turn off the power, they used KillDesk, right, their own application to go ahead and wipe all of the machines, including the, the engineering workstation to the point where it, the, the hard drive actually has to be replaced uh, to be able to get the system back up and running. So that was where, again, the Russians came in. They really did a lot of work to turn off the power. And then again, it was making sure the UPSs didn't, ex you know, didn't exist essentially and making sure that, oh yeah, we're going to wipe your engineering workstation to where you can't even do anything with it. You can't even boot it after we turn off the breakers. And that's where uh, the Ukrainians they had to fall back to manual operations. And this comes up in a lot of conversations today because think, whether it's advanced nation states, there's a conversation I just had about EMPs wiping out all of your computer systems and, and control systems. Or what if it's ransomware and control system specific malware or uh, ransomware that people are starting to talk more and more about for whatever reason it's like can your environment fall back to manual operations right still can you still generate power can you still trans you know, put supply power to the people can you still get water out there will the train still run etc cetera, etc cetera, right is the manufacturing plant still manufacture what it you know what it creates so start thinking about that because especially in newer environments, they might not actually have the ability to go back to manual operations. And that's something that we need to consider very seriously and go back and retrofit those environments so that they have manual operations because it's only remember, it's not a question of if, it's only a question of when. So when we talk about, and this is what we were mentioning a little bit earlier with IT OT convergence, remember we should say more and more Windows host in OT environments. Again, from a pen testing perspective, when I talk about IT OT convergence, that's what I always think about. It's just the fact that there's more and more Windows systems everywhere in OT, which makes it so much easier for the attackers to get into the environment. Again, once you get to those traditional OT assets like PLCs, HMIs, the DCS, or you see RTUs, or I should put SIS on, on that list as well. But that's where we have to stop and then kind of reset and put on the, the engineering kind of thinking hat, I guess, right? Where we're starting to then understand well, what is this asset doing in the environment? What is it controlling? Right? And that's, that's actually a different part of the, the pen test methodology. So we'll come back and, and we're going to talk about that and we'll, and we'll see a few examples. So things have, have changed in pen testing in, in both IT and especially in OT over not only the last couple of years in IT, but now in, in OT. And this is, and we're going to talk about the, the most recent Ukrainian blackout in 2022, where the Russian attackers all the techniques they used, they were all living off the land techniques. When we talk about living off the land, the idea, you know, think if I'm an attacker or pen tester, I come into the environment. If I'm concerned with the defenders detecting my activity. So if that OT environment actually is performing things like network security monitoring and they have people actually watching for and responding to alerts. If I say, 
download and install even something like Nmap. Right? That should be detected and alerted on. That should be a dead giveaway that you know, somebody's doing something that they shouldn't be and it's probably an attacker. Or what if I have a bunch of Python scripts that I want to, to run and I'm on a, let's say, a data historian running Windows, but it doesn't have Python, so I download and install Python. That should set off an alert that the defenders catch and say, hey, why did somebody download and install Python on this Windows machine? I know in my day job, if we ever see Python get installed on the machine, it's it's all hands on deck. Now, it's never an attacker. It's somebody that, you know, they created some Python scripts that they want to run, but in an unauthorized fashion. So it's like we need to put a stop to that. But again, living off the land, this idea is once we gain access to a system, we're using the commands, the capabilities of that system that already exists. We're not downloading anything to that machine. We're not installing anything. We're not introducing any new capabilities. If we're not introducing any new capabilities, if we're not downloading anything, then there's really nothing for you know, let's see, network security monitoring tools to detect. So when you think about, not only am I not downloading these things, but what if, like we saw in, in Russia back in 2015, right, when they had to write that ICS-specific malware, Black Energy 3, right? that takes money, that takes time. Living off the land, I just have to learn how to use those tools. I just have to learn how to be a Windows administrator, and I know how to break in to Windows machines. That's actually like when I took the OSCP exam, it was I ran rampant through the Windows machines because I had been a Windows administrator for, know, at that point, like 15 plus years, 20 years. On the Linux side, mm, not so much because I, I wasn't, you know, I, I can use Kali Linux, but that was about it. Don't judge me for those of you that are Linux gurus. When we talk about not only is it about getting into an OT environment and finding Windows machines everywhere and being able to move throughout the environment and using default um, capabilities within Windows, things like PowerShell. Remember, PowerShell is designed to give an administrator the ability to control every aspect of a Windows machine and a Windows network. If that falls in the hands of attacker, yeah, they can control every aspect of that machine in the network. But also, well, what if you're able to log into an actual OT asset? And that's what, what happened in the Ukraine blackout in 2022. It's what we're going to look at in a sec. And I am still very fascinated with the idea of Pipe Dream, or what you also see as in controller, where again, I've never seen Pipe Dream. It's one that you know Dragos has, and they demonstrate its capabilities. They never show the code. I'd love to see the code. <laughs> this idea is kind of I always think of it, it's it's like Metasploit, right? In the IT world, it's this automated framework for manipulating and controlling OT assets, but it it's not. You know, where Metasploit was more like we're going to create all these different types of exploits, it's really pipe dream. It's just this living off the land framework that just connects to different devices like PLCs and, and HMIs and uses their default capabilities to control the environment. And there's a couple of videos, especially from the most recent DEF CON videos, like uh, a lot of the Dragos folks have have done where they show up in, oh, I forget his last name, where they demonstrate they had set up, um, uh, I think it was like a water furnace and demonstrated pipe dream and how essentially it could create uh, to you know, create an explosion in that in that water furnace, if I remember exactly um, what they had had put together. But again, it's where they're not necessarily, again, downloading exploits or having you know, to create ICS specific malware, it's just using all the default capabilities of those systems. And just like if I'm on a Windows machine and I use PowerShell to you know, go out and I don't know, run a port scan, and we'll actually see an example of that. So that's partly where it gets into this conversation of, and, and we'll talk about using ChatGPT to create offensive or defensive you know, security tools in OT, and I've had a lot of fun with that. So we're definitely going to talk about some of that in, in this part. 
So in the Ukrainian blackout in 2022, remember this is the one that we didn't find out for for about a year for again for whatever reason, but Mandiant had finally come out at the end of 2023 and say, oh by the way, the Russians had gone into the Ukraine and created a, a blackout in 2022, right? Just and it was coordinated along with with the the war. Russians were dropping bombs on critical infrastructure and I'm sure other things at, at the same time, but it was seemed to be a very coordinated stri- strike where it was one of those great examples where, not great that it happens obviously, but a perfect example of where you have physical and cyber warfare capabilities come together. And so not only are the Russians, you know, turning off the, the power, but then they're also dropping bombs, right? They're turning off the power through, you know, cyber means. And they turn off the power again. They, it wasn't the 2015 or the 2016 blackout days. Now they're using living off the land techniques. They're getting into the environment. They're moving from windows machine to windows machine using living off the land techniques, right? Using all the built in default capabilities of windows. And then they finally get to the micro SCADA console that's used to issue commands to, like we we're talking about earlier, the breakers, where we could just flip the breakers, flip the breakers and turn the power off. And like they did in 2015 and 2016, and a lot of other attacks, like not Petya, right? they love to wipe the disks. So they get into the environment, move IT to OT through all the Windows machines, find the micro SCADA console that they use to control the breakers, flip the breakers to turn the power off, and then wipe all the Windows machines. I don't think they could, they actually wipe the micro SCADA console, or I didn't I see any information related to that. But for all the Windows machines to get to the micro SCADA console to even think about trying to turn the breakers on, and that's where, remember, we have to be prepared in a worst case scenario. I'm talking about, especially an incident response plan. Are we able to fall back to manual operations? Okay, whether it's ransomware, a nation state attacker, or an EMP that we were talking about earlier. Whatever the cost, can we fall back to manual operations? Again, some environments do not have that capability which is very concerning. But again, I, I sh- again I'm, putting, I'm putting on my defensive hat again, unfortunately, I have to remember this is the, the offensive uh, part of the course. <laughs> Excuse me. So before we get into the, the framework, right, I just wanna revisit this idea. Well, how do we break in to the OT environment? And we, we talked about, you know, there's the five main ways or, or the number one way is an attacker, right, is going to come in to the gain access to the IT environment and then move down those layers into the OT network. And again, it's mostly Windows systems, right? They get a user in the back office, layer five, to click on a link or open up an attachment to infect their system and give them access over the Internet. And they move throughout the IT environment, find maybe a vulnerability in the ITOT DMZ, right? Find they're gathering usernames and passwords or credentials from the IT network because a lot of times they're just reused in the OT side of the house. Find that path from IT to OT, whether it's you know some type of uh, remote service in the DMZ, maybe a VPN appliance, maybe it's Maybe it's just a maybe a data historian that is not well protected by access control lists, and it's wide open and it hasn't been patched in three months. We well, find that path into the OT network, and then we move again, mostly from Windows machines to Windows machines until we get to those traditional OT assets. Or there's also the other approach: is well, what if we can go directly into the OT environment? And that's where we think of things like what if somebody, what if we have physical access and we can just walk into the, the plant and plug in a laptop into the environment? Game over, right? Or what if we you know, use a USB attack and drop USBs in, in the parking lot and somebody takes it in and plugs it into the OT network? That, that could happen. Or what if there's, you know, when we talk about using tools like Shodan to find OT 
assets that are connected to the internet and that they're sitting on the OT network. If I can compromise that, that's my initial foothold. And I'm on the OT network. And we're going to see an example of that coming up. So those are really the, the two main ways that I look at, right? Somebody coming in through IT, right? usually as a result of a successful phishing attack, or somehow we have a way to go directly to OT, right? physically, right? Of course, that requires us to be there, so there's some sense of danger, right? or USB attacks, or what if I infect somebody's laptop that's going into the environment, like somebody that's doing operations and maintenance work, right? That definitely could be a, a route. Or okay, my favorite, what if somebody has an OT asset already exposed to the internet and we just compromise it and then that's our initial foothold. So the rest of what we're going to talk about is the attack methodology based off of the MITRE attack framework. And we've already talked about the MITRE attack framework. Remember, here's the one for IT, and this is what, these are all the different options we could use. You can't even see them, right? There's so many to break into the IT environment. Or the top row is the, the what we call the tactics, and those are broken down into techniques. And then each of those have procedures that are associated with them, like how do you do these things? And the nice thing with MITRE ATT&CK is they give you examples and they even give you like real world event examples of, oh, this is what was used in like Trisis. But, and, and we'll see some of those as, as we go throughout. So when we talk about MITRE ATT&CK for ICS, right, you see it's much, much smaller. And I can actually read it on one slide, barely. And you can see that the different, remember, the tactics from initial access and then to impact. And then all those in between. I didn't necessarily like the order, and I don't necessarily know if these are 100% to be in order, or I could see where you can kind of mix them up, and there's a lot of overlap. I took one particular approach that we're going to look at. Now, the one thing that I thought was missing here was it still didn't do any reconnaissance. Because, yes, reconnaissance is normally associated with IT, but remember, if I want to, what if I want to look for, like, those OT assets that are exposed to the Internet, right? That's reconnaissance. That's still going to be part of my attack path in ICS. So I didn't want to take that off the plate. So I, played, I, I went back and, and put it in. And so there's reconnaissance. Also, in IT, there's a tactic called resource development. Right? That's also something that we do in, in OT. And I understand the way they didn't include it in, in ICS. I like, I love how they've done the, the ICS layout. I think it's great. It's just one of those things, like when we had the 62443 conversation, I think when you look at it on the surface and you're trying to learn it the first time, it can come across as really ugly. <laughs> it's, and that's my only, my only it's a complaint, and I, again, I hate saying that because I love MITRE ATT&CK, especially for ICS so much. So what I went ahead and had done was, was take all of that and put it together, right? And really, this is the basis for the rest of this part. So going through and putting it at least in order that makes sense to me right? and kind of mapping it out. I like to think, see things, you know, from a, like a... a I'm a very visual learner, right? I, I want graphs. I want, I want to see graphical representations that help me learn. Like, I'm okay with a list and I can memorize this. And, and you know, looking at a framework like that, yeah, like I can memorize this. But it doesn't really, I'm not learning if I'm just memorizing. I need to see how the, please, the pieces click together. So when we talk about performing reconnaissance, Ultimately, right, going through all of these steps to where we can have control over that environment and impact the network, we can impact the systems, the, we can impact the process. And so this is what I had come up with, right? And this idea where, yeah, you know, we start with reconnaissance, get initial access, go through discovery collection. And there's actually kind of 
slight technical differences between the two that we're going to get into. And then we're running commands and we're moving between assets. And yeah, I get that. Like execution can kind of happen anywhere and lateral movement can happen anywhere. But and then we can also talk about things like persistence, like how does the attacker stay in the environment even after maybe you know, they gain access to the system. But that system always it, maybe it gets re rebooted. Like, how do they still maintain persistence? Or how do they maintain persistence after you find one of the ways that they have access into the environment? Do they have a, a backup route? Right? Evasion. How do they uh, evade being detected? Okay. A lot of environments don't, don't even, they're not even doing detection. So, so it's not that hard. And there's an idea, do we have some type of command and control channel, right? And that, so that can also happen, you know, along the way. That's kind of how why I have it off to the side there. But and then ultimately, where we're trying to build up to where we have control over the process and we can make changes in the environment. So that's the way I see, and that's the order in which we're going to go through these. And so we're not going to spend just a level set. We're not going to spend time on, you know, getting into persistence and invasion and command and control. We're going to talk about them, but I wanted to spend, because we already have so much content, I do want to get to the other sections from reconnaissance and initial access, discovery, collection, execution, and then inhibit response function. And so the idea is we want to get into what each of these are and see some examples of each of these. That's what we're going to do for the rest of this, this part. But there's a lot. So reconnaissance, that reconnaissance is something that we've already talked about previously from you know, the using Shodan and, and DNS Dumpster and some other tools, right? So we're not going to spend a lot of time here. We've already covered, I'd say, I'd say a fair amount. You, I, I could do a 40-hour course on reconnaissance, but we've talked about right using tools, right? Performing OSINT or open source intelligence gathering. Right. using all those freely available resources out on the internet to gather information about a target environment. And I try to put kind of, it's not a checklist, but I try to put everything we talked about previously right, on this one slide. Because if I have a target, right, I want to find out what their public IP, ad, IP ranges are. I want to find domain names and subdomains, right, host names or fully qualified domain names, right? using tools like DNS Dumpster to be able to map out those resources they have exposed to the internet. Again, what if they have an OT network asset exposed to the internet? That's pretty much already game over. We can also look for, if, especially for larger environments that have multiple IP ranges, they could have an ASN or autonomous system name that they bring all those IP addresses to. And that helps us identify if an IP address associated with a company, is it in the cloud? Is it on on-prem? Right? I'm more than likely looking at trying to break into on-prem resources, not cloud resources. Almost. Almost always. Right? So we had that conversation previously. Again, if we have hosts that are exposed to the internet, well, what is it? Right? Is it, oh, it's a PLC. Well, what type of PLC? Who made the PLC? Oh, it's a Siemens PLC. It's a SL1200. What firmware version is it running? Maybe there's a vulnerability in that version. Would I be able to exploit it? Or maybe even does it expose information? We're going to look at an example of a real live exposed PLC that's out there on the internet that we can look at and potentially use to break into an OT network. Now, we're not breaking into the OT network. We don't have authorization. But there's nothing that says we can't load a web page that's exposed to the internet. We can use things like social media and information we find off the internet and other places to be able to find the names of employees that work at companies, right? What they do. A lot of times we, we, we joke, but it's serious that the attackers out there, they have better organization charts that they've built than we have within our own companies, right? Because it's true. They do their research. The more research you do, right? The more, when we talk about relevant data, that's why I actually have it highlighted at the top. The more relevant data you have, the more successful your mission is gonna be. That was something that I had picked up when I worked in uh, the support teams that uh, worked for the, that supported the US Navy SEALs. 
right? You gather as much information about a target environment before you go in. And the more relevant, right, the more successful you're going to be. So things like email addresses for phishing campaigns or contact numbers, if I'm going to call these people and try to scam them over the phone, right? Personal interest, things like home addresses, right? what they're exposing on social media, other personal information that we can use for things like phishing or vishing attacks to make them more potent. You know, company information for and those trust relationships with other entities. As an example, actually, in my day job, we got a call from a high-level government agency one day that said, you know, the there's this nation-state group of attackers we're tracking we have access to some of their chat channels and they're talking about they wanted to break into your company and they weren't going to come directly after you. They were going to target one of your new partners because they saw there was a, a news announcement, there's a press release about your new you, uh, kind of partnership with this, this outside company. And then they were going to uh, break into this company and use that relationship to get into your company. It happens. Right? What if I want to about physical locations where I can break into that facility physically? Right? We often don't have those conversations in cyber. A lot of times in cyber, we don't think of physical security, even though physical security is the foundation on which cyber is built. And what if we can even find potential credentials with usernames and, and maybe even passwords that are still valid? That It actually happens. Or if you see somebody's password was, I don't know, like Christmas 2015, back in 2015, and it's now 2024, well, there's a really good chance that Christmas 2024 is, is their password today. There's a really good chance. It happens. So there's a lot, right, that we had talked about previously, and, and the detail out in the MITRE attack framework. Remember all those, you know, we take all the, the tactic of reconnaissance and break it down into all these different techniques. I don't always count active scanning as reconnaissance, but it could, especially if you're maybe on the outside and you're doing maybe an Nmap scan to see what's connected to the internet. Again, I can use Shodan and Census, right? They've, they've done all that work. The only thing, yeah, I don't like about Shodan is they don't scan all 65,535 TCP ports. Census does. Shodan doesn't. That's the only thing I have against, against Shodan. Again, how do we find out information about a target environment? Again, here's that kind of what we walked through before. Right? And we could look at their website to see at least, oh, we know their domain name, right? We would use, I think we were talking about like using Starbucks right? as, as an example because I do a lot of work from Starbucks. So I go to starbucks.com, and that's a great starting point because then we can start determining IP addresses, right? Those public ranges, the domain names, the fully qualified domain names, the subdomains, right? Finding the host using tools like Shodan Census. And then there's FOFA, which is a kind of like a Chinese version of Shodan. So some people might prefer to use that. And, and there's an English version. There's the link for the English version you can see at fofa.info. And I also mentioned that I do have, remember, those quick start guides that I have prepared for things like Shodan and Nmap with you're doing scanning that you can find in my GitHub. And then also, and this is one that um, kind of a, a LinkedIn friend had recently started called ICS Rank, which I thought was really cool. And I think it, it just started... So I say give them some more time. But even now, I think it's really useful. And the idea is that you can actually go to ICS, right? And we'll, we'll try it here, out here in a sec. But where you can look up, like you can see on the left-hand side, we have all these vendors and then all the different types of OT assets. And then they get even more detailed and more specific. And if you have a specific model that you're looking for, and then you can click on the link and it'll just take you to Shodan and run that query for you. Like in this example, you can find that one specific type of, I think this is a Rockwell asset. Or in this case, so we can load ICS rank 
and then I always, you know, I always think of Siemens still. That's always good. there. You know, my first project was a power plant. Siemens is huge in, in power and, and Siemens was everywhere in that plant. <laughs> so I always go to Siemens. I actually have a, a SL1200 uh, in my lab. Uh, but you can see where they break them down. Here I see listings for, here's a, for a, a 300. And so I can click on go Shodan. And then if we're already logged into Shodan, which I am, you can see that it does the search. And in this case, right, it's just searching Shodan for the string somatic S7-300. So anywhere you see that string, it'll return that. Now, in this case, and this is one of those things that I don't like about Siemens, is that they actually run SNMP on their PLCs by default. And if you're not familiar, SNMP is typically used in the IT world on things like network switches and that you would log into it. There's no older versions of SNMP don't have necessarily this idea of like a username and password. They do have an idea of a community string, which is which is a password. And by default, it's always public. And so in this case, what we're seeing are Siemens S7300 PLCs that are running SNMP by default and they have that default, you know, password, quote unquote, or community string of public. And so then what SNMP does is it stores pieces of information about that asset. So here you can see that we just query it to say, hey, tell us about yourself. And, or in this case, Shodan hits, hits a device on the internet and sees that SNMP is open on UDP 161 and just says, hey, tell me about yourself. And says, oh, hi, I'm uh, Siemens S7300 PLC, right? I'm running these versions of, that's probably SNMP. So I wanted to explore SNMP a little bit more just uh, for a few minutes, why it can be so bad in even in OT environments. I've used it in IT environments to literally take over not only individual systems, but entire networks. But it's still information that you can collect about your PLCs, right? In this instance, around those, those Siemens PLCs. And we'll actually, we're going to come back and talk about that a little bit more later on in the process. But while we're here, I do want to look at just this idea of SNMP. And so there is a tool in SNMP, or sorry, that you can run a tool you can run on like Kali Linux, which is the popular distribution that pen testers use in, in both IT and OT, or you can run it on Windows. I have it installed here on, on my Windows machine. And in this case, I know my home router and wireless access point from the cable company is using SNMP and it is using the default community string of public, which means it's not secure. So I can connect to that and what it'll do is SNMP walk connects and it literally just connects to essentially SNMP is a, host a database of every piece of information imaginable about that specific host. So if you run SNMP walk, you can see it'll just go on and on forever. I'm going to stop it. But again, to give you an idea just of what SNMP can, can store, right? That in this case, you can see, oh yeah, here's, the first piece of information, that's probably a MAC address. And here's a, oh, here's oh, the, the brand of, of the router and the, the operating system it's running and the version. So we could look up to see what, what type of, if there's vulnerabilities associated with that asset. And then you can see like different values, like 20, 20, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We don't necessarily know what those are. Now, if there's documentation that we could look up, it's like if you look at a PLC for the first time, from, especially from an attacker's perspective, and you see remember the coils and the registers that we had looked at previously in one of the earlier parts that you don't know by default, like, what are these values? Maybe that one, if I turn it to a zero, it turns off, you know, the power <laughs> at, at that plant to keep it simple. And we can see, again, more pieces of information storing things like network interfaces. You can see it's tracking different VLANs. You can see more about, oh, here's the actual um, access 
point or the SSID, right, for the, the wireless access point, right? Yes, that's my uh, apartment complex. <laughs> Uh, you can see um, more information about the, the wireless component in it and, and so on. And you can see it's been up for 36 days and 21 hours. So we must have had the power trip, you know, 36 days ago and so on and so on. So you can have a lot of interesting information. Sometimes devices actually store even things like passwords here. I've, I've seen that, even though fortunately that's very rare these days. Thing is really SNMP was meant for monitoring network devices. So Siemens likes the idea. And I, I like the idea of going in, connecting to a device, even like a PLC and being able to monitoring different aspects of it. Uh, the problem is if you're going to use SNMP, make sure that you set a secure string, right? It's, it's just like any password. Make it long, make it strong, so that way it can't be easily guessed. SNMP also has uh, write capability. So what if you can make changes? By default, it's read-only, uh, but, but you can also have a, the ability to write and make changes. So in SNMP, I, I prefer to stay away from it. And if you need it, uh, then sure, use it for monitoring. But yeah, I would, I, I just, from OT assets, I, there's better, there's other ways to, to monitor and, and not have to use SNMP. But, but, but Siemens has it. So we'll, we'll look at a later example of, of Siemens and, and how Nmap can query that information as well to get information from the asset, which can't just, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of. <laughs> Anyways, didn't mean this for this to become an SNMP lecture per se, but all right, let's jump back to our slides. So after all that, <laughs> that was going from using a string, a search string that we found in ICS rank to run that through Shodan to find uh, different PLCs that were connected to the internet, right? And is the example that we we had looked at for uh, the Siemens, right? It actually wasn't finding those Siemens devices because of, a, let's say, a web interface that was exposed. It was actually finding them through SNMP. So if SNMP had been turned off, then these assets would never have been exposed, would have been found, I should say, right? They're still exposed to the internet. They just wouldn't have been found through that search string. So again, it's still very, very, very bad that these are exposed to the internet. Still also, again, to me, it's very bad that they're running SNMP and very bad that it's using the default community string of, of public. So anyways, so that was a quick side trip <laughs> into the wonderful world of SNMP, which it's, especially whenever I see it in IT, it means ooh, I might have a foothold here and, and same thing in, in, in OT. So can we've spent a lot of time previously in reconnaissance and finding again, there's just another highlight of how we can find OT assets exposed to the internet. And again, I did want to mention ICS rank because I thought that was really cool that they have put that together. Now, ultimately, right, we want to get that initial access. We want that initial foothold into the environment. I want control over a computer, a asset, something with an IP address, more than likely, in the network that I can use to then gain access to other assets in the environment. So it goes back to the, the question of where do we start with the typical OT pen test? And that's where we're going to assume that the attackers are already in the IT network. There's no reason, especially why a client would pay an OT pen tester to break into the OT environment, right? The whole point of having an OT pen test is to test the OT network, not, not the IT. So we're going to assume that the IT network has already been compromised. Again, this is the vast majority of pen tests that are performed for OT. It's giving the pen tester access to the IT environment. Sometimes that's over VPN. Sometimes they might send a appliance or like a laptop that would be set up on the IT network that they would have remote access to if you allow like a command and control channel to go out on a connection, like a reverse uh, SSH tunnel or something like that. Or 
what if we, and this is something we do at the office, is we set up, we provision a workstation for the pen test. We even give them uh, credentials. We give them an email uh, account. We set them up like a, a brand new employee. And then you watch to see, well, what can you do from there? Because again, it's really emulating what happens if an employee falls for a phishing attack. Right? They click on that link, they open up the attachment, they infect their system. So then the attacker has access to that system as that employee. So what are they able to do? Are they able to do things like bypass the local malware? Again, that's a little bit more IT focused pen testing, but I think it's interesting also to to watch as as uh, OT pen testers, right? Because of, of those attackers. And I know there's again whether we do that or not. Anyways, it's once the attackers in the environment again whether they are on one of our workstations, whether you know they're sitting there physically, and maybe they're running Kali Linux, or they're coming in over the VPN, probably using Kali Linux. And then it's their goal to see can they compromise any assets in the IT OT DMZ, because more than likely all of those are Windows assets. More than likely, if we compromise any of those or we crash them, it's not going to impact production. We, of course, want to double check. It's not going to affect the availability or uptime of the plant. And so if that's the case, and we understand that, and we've determined that, and consider and talk with engineering and the folks that do O&M and, and et cetera, then... Let's test the ITOT DMC because remember the, the main way that attackers get into the OT environment is from IT and they're going to move from the IT to the ITOT DMC. If a pen tester can't find a way into the ITOT DMC, well, we have to understand they couldn't find it. it doesn't mean that there's not a way. But also if they didn't, then it's a, still a good sign that we might be fairly secure from IT to OT. Again, I'm not ever going to assume 100% ever. And again, it's always going to depend on the skill and the experience of the one or two people that are, are doing the pen test themselves. But that's most ICS OT pen tests. It's not pen testing the OT environment. It's pen testing, can we get into the ICS the, or the IT OT DMZ from IT? Because again, that's the number one way attackers get in. That's the route that attackers take from IT to get into OT. So we're going to simulate that. So going back and looking at the image earlier, right? We'll have our pen tester, right? On the IT network, can they get into IT, OT, DMZ? That's usually the scope. Now maybe it's, can you get into like layer three? Maybe can you access an engineering workstation? and find sensitive information about a the process like that. That could be in scope, but usually it's, here's access to IT, and then can you get into the IT OT DMZ from there? Now, MITRE ATT&CK has a whole list of techniques. Right? The idea is, remember MITRE ATT&CK really was started from the IT world to answer the question, what do attackers do once they get that initial foothold in the environment? That's why I was always fascinated with MITRE ATT&CK when it first came out, because that was one of those big questions I think a lot of us have. What do attackers do once they get in the environment? So how do we, and this is the rest of what we're going to talk about, right? is how do we map out the rest of the OT network? How do we gain control over those other assets, whether there's maybe there's those data historians running Windows, or what if they are PLCs, or what are HMIs or DCS? How do we get that initial foothold? And so they talk about those different techniques. Now, I did want to highlight a couple of these. I think a lot of these, most people in general have experience with or have heard of especially from the IT world. Um, and I go through each of these when I'm doing the actual dedicated pen testing course for ICSOT. But I did want to highlight 
two of them. One was, I think these are some of the more interesting ones. So the Rogue Master. The idea is, and I know we try to get away from master-slave terminology, and I have to apologize because they're still referring to it here in in the uh, framework. But the idea is we have a lot of configurations where you have one system, think of it as a server, right, that controls other assets as, as clients. They're more like rogue servers, right? Or rogue control, if you want. And we see this a lot in OT environments. And so there's ways where you can, a lot of times, especially over wireless communication, you can pretend right to be one of these control systems right or one of these servers it's just like when you talk about rogue wireless access points there's nothing to stop me from going into a starbucks bringing my own wireless access point turning it on calling it starbucks so when people come in and they go to join wi-fi they see oh, two starbucks listings right, on their system and they might actually join mine, right? There, there's nothing to stop them from from doing that. You know, I'm masquerading as a legitimate system. So in this case, when we talk about OT, it's kind of the same concept. And we also mentioned a lot of these types of setups in OT environments, even still in 2024, there's no authentication. So when I send a command to a remote host, I don't have to send a, something like a username and password. You're seeing that start to change. And there's also arguments of whether we should use authentication or whether we shouldn't because using authentication can complicate matters. And what if we're in an incident and the there's uh, maybe a dangerous situation or even plant availability at issue and we're running around trying to find a password or credentials that nobody knows right so there's there's arguments pro you know for and against using credentials for for this type of connectivity and command and control again so we start getting into those conversations of you see safety and plant uptime it's like mm, do we really want authentication or not and it's going to really come down to the risk tolerance of, of the, uh, the asset owner, ultimately. But the idea is, kind of with this rogue, again, server, like this example, when they talk about, I guess, the Marucci Shire, right? you see, this is where a disgruntled insider, and this is a perfect example of why insiders are so dangerous in OT environments. Because we talked about with pen testers, right, or outside attackers that don't have any information or knowledge about your environment. If they break in, right, they'll spread through all the Windows hosts and they'll move to lower levels and eventually get to PLCs. Once you get to a PLC, kind of like with that SNMP walk example we were looking at, you see a bunch of numbers and zeros and ones or 20s and just all these numbers that don't mean anything. By default, you might have a few that are kind of give me's like when you, you know, like what well, guess an MP walk, you saw, oh, there's a MAC address, and, right? Sometimes pieces of information jump out at you and you're like, oh, I know what that is. But the vast majority of the time it's you're like, I have no idea what that means. I don't know what the value in that coil or that register means. So an insider, they actually could know what all those values are. They can know, oh, change this one to a zero or change this 50 to a 50,000 to make some change in the environment. In this case, there was a disgruntled employee that uh, essentially left the left the company, um, was disgruntled for many reasons. You can go and you can read the story at the link there, but had equipment where he could drive around and send wireless signals he could transmit and basically, he was taking the place of one of these stations as this rogue server and issuing commands. So ultimately, where you can see, yeah, one was 265,000 gallons of sewage were released, you know, killed, obviously, the marine life and didn't smell great. If, if 
who lived in the vicinity, and eventually they they caught the guy driving around with this stolen radio equipment from you know that he had taken from from the job. So he was arrested. I think he ended up in jail for for two years and had to pay you know a, a fine, probably mostly a slap on the wrist for for what he did. But it's a great example. It's another one though. People point well, nobody died. It, it's a great example of yes. Not in this situation, but you can apply this to other OT environments where that type of attack could lead to somebody dying. But that's the idea of this like rogue and rogue master or rogue server, okay, where in different situations, if you can masquerade or spoof or pretend to be right, this system that controls other systems and issue those commands. Right, those agents or those clients out there, right? They're going to get the command and and they're going to follow those instructions. So that's where and we can talk about you know with different wireless compromises, right? And a lot of times we think of like Wi-Fi is the most popular type of of uh, wireless communication, right? When we think of Wi-Fi and it's very prevalent also in OT networks these days. And there's, but there's also other types of wireless communication as well. So, of course, again, Wi-Fi, we see it not only everywhere in our homes, in our offices, but it, it's also in most OT environments these days, small, medium, large. And so it's nice where, you know, if I'm a technician and I can walk through a plan or out in the field and I can connect to an asset over Wi-Fi or maybe Bluetooth, but I'm connected and I'm able to access and do troubleshooting and monitoring of that asset. That makes life really easy on me as a technician. And the fact that I never had a, we didn't run cables. Right? And because there's, there's a cost there, just like in IT, right? We don't like running cables because it just costs money and it takes time. So, why bother? The problem is with, of course, Wi-Fi. Remember, Wi-Fi, just like in, whether it's in IT or OT, most Wi-Fi is still only protected by that shared password when you go to join the Wi-Fi network or what they call the pre-share key. Right? That password you type in to be able to join that network. It is very easy to break into most Wi-Fi networks if all their protected by is that password or that pre-shared key especially if it's just like any password if it's if it's shorter than most if it doesn't have any special characters right it's going to be very easy to intercept that and decrypt it so with tools like if you're running kali linux you can use uh, aircrack which is a suite of of tools to be able to i mean it's a really fun you know, kind of collection of tools to use, right? It allows you to see all the wireless access points in the area, use, use it to do Wi-Fi assessments, security assessments all the time. So you find all the wireless access points, you can see, you know, signal strength, so you, you can actually then physically track down, right, these, these access points, right? Because the signal will get stronger the closer you are. You know, if I'm walking towards it, oh, it's getting stronger. If I'm walking away from it, it's getting weaker. You get the idea. Then you can also connect to any of those access points. And now you're not on the network necessarily, but you're, what you're doing is you're connecting to the access point to where you can see what clients are connected to the access point. And what you can do is what they call a deauthentication attack, which means that this is the really fun, interesting thing is you can see those those clients that are connected to the access point to the Wi-Fi network, and you can kick them off. The whole point is, especially think of like a Windows laptop. If I kick it off the Wi-Fi network, the first thing it's going to try to do is reconnect. When it reconnects, it has to send the password. Now it sends the password encrypted, but guess what? We just captured it using the air crack suite of tools. That's why we just kick people off because then they reconnect. They never even saw anything happened. 
when they reconnected, they sent their encrypted password. We take the encrypted password and we take it offline to decrypt it. And if it's a simple password, if it's not a strong password, it's going to be really, really easy to, to break. And then in a couple hours, maybe if that, then we have the password to be able to join that Wi-Fi network. Once we're on that network, then we have access to, to the network itself, and then we can launch our attacks. Now, some of you might have heard of the Flipper Zero. We actually had at a at a joint venture where an employee showed up with one of these and in a industrial control critical infrastructure environment this is not something that we want to see an employee or anybody bring into any environment let alone critical infrastructure and so you can imagine there was disciplinary action taken for for this uh, employee but the idea is that, and you can see these, are, I took all of this like word from word from the Flipper 0.1 website. And I actually ordered one of these finally. I was putting it off forever, but I finally ordered one. And you see the idea, oh, it's this portable multi-tool for pen testers and geeks, right? Slash right, attackers. Right. It loves hacking digital stuff, radio protocols, access control systems, hardware, and more. Fully open source, customizable, right. awesome. And so even, again, from it sounds like a lot of fun. And they are a lot of fun to use. I love watching the videos. <laughs> but when you think about it from an attacker perspective or from the defender perspective, again, it's not something we want to show up in any IT environment, let alone critical infrastructure. So if you are going to do a pen test course, make sure you have authorization even to use it in the first place. Because where it gets really interesting, and this is where we start to see you know, a lot of environments have things like boom bears. Think of like rail environments. Those are there for safety, right? The boom comes down, people know not to pass. If you capture the signal with the flipper zero. Again, the idea is that it listens for wireless communication. And if it captures the signal to raise the boom, it saves that. And then you can replay it to raise the boom. If it captures the signal to lower the boom, you can lower the boom. That's why a lot of the videos that you see are, oh, you can, if you capture your neighbor opening their garage door, you can resend the signal to open their garage door when they're not home the next day. You can send the signal, right, to, to lower the garage door. So then you can see they're talking garage doors, boom bears. Again, where there's that physical safety, you can use People use this to break into houses all the time and cars. So is it a lot of fun? Yes. Do attackers love these? Yes. You can see, well, what about when we look at... ID cards, right, that you use to badge in for an office. It does proximity cards. It can duplicate those. The kicker, of course, is that last line where it says Flipper Zero owners can share card IDs remotely with other Flipper Zero users. Great if you're a pen test team and there's you know multiples of you, sure, you can share <laughs> clone credentials or ID cards, but just general and attackers sharing information, right? That's not what we want to have happen. I don't want a lot of you know attackers out there with cloned cards to gain access to like you know, my facilities, obviously. But the Flipper Zero makes it so a, a six-year-old could do it. You know, same thing now when we talk about duplicating NFC. So debit cards, credit cards. So then you get into to more or other using other types of IDs, maybe in, in an environment. And then Bluetooth. Not only can you, you know, interact with your Flipper Zero over a, an app you have on your phone over Bluetooth, but you can actually also use it to hack devices over Bluetooth. You can even use it apparently I was watching one video where you can use it basically to do a denial of service on Wi-Fi. So if all of your security cameras are on Wi-Fi, 
which a lot of times they are because it goes back to that point, right? We don't want to run cables that essentially you can turn off all the cameras just by taking Wi-Fi down. And you could use a Flipper Zero to do that. So there's a lot of concerns, right? If I'm a pen tester, right, especially a physical pen tester, I'm definitely going to have a Flipper Zero. But from a defense perspective, right, understand that attackers can have Flipper Zeros or other systems and devices to do this, right? Before, especially more advanced attackers would just build these types of systems where now and you, I, I just bought one off the main website the other day for 200 bucks. I did not do the optional $50 uh, module to play games on it. 200 US dollars. And I always go back to this one picture on the site where it's, oh, you can raise and lower this boom barrier. Just, oh, uh, arm goes up, arm goes down. That's not something that we want because it's there for safety and security purposes. So again, more physical in a lot of respects, but it's also wireless communication. So it's that blend, right, of cyber and physical. So I did want to make sure to talk about it here. So, all right. So discovery, so we're talking about discovery. This is where we have that initial foothold on the network. And once I have that initial foothold on the network, I want to be able to map, start mapping out the network itself. I want to find all of the things. I want to find the data historians and the engineering workstations and the PLCs and the SIS and the DCS. And I want to find everything. I want to know everything that's there. I want a better network map than the actual defenders have, that the operators have. And a lot of environments I go, even brand new environments, it's it's like trying to find, it's like, where's the one complete, you know, asset register or inventory? I, I want to be able to create an asset register better than what they actually have. That's discovery, just mapping out what's there. Not necessarily digging deep into getting a lot of information from each of those assets. That's going to come next, especially OT assets. But discovery is, I want to map out just, again, I want a good lay of the land at a high level. I want to know the IP addresses, right? The live hosts, right? The IP addresses. Now, remember also in OT environments, you can have assets that aren't communicating over TCP IP, but over some other type of protocol. So don't get hung up or just stuck on things with IP addresses. I remember making that mistake in the very beginning. Not everything has an IP address. Maybe it's running Profinet or some other industrial control protocol. Or maybe it's a standalone system. We want to build out that network map, though, of anything connected to the network. If it's out there, I want to know about it. Because, again, it goes back to the more information I have, especially the more relevant information, the more successful I'm going to be in my attack again, as a penetration tester. And we can start to look at a high level of, oh, okay, I see different hosts at IP addresses. I want to get an like, idea of, is it a PLC, an HMI, right? Is, oh, is it a Windows machine? Well, what is it doing? Is Oh, maybe it's an Active Directory domain controller versus an HMI running Windows. Or maybe, oh, that Windows machine is running SQL Server, so you know, 100 bucks says that's a data historian. Versus something like, oh, Windows 11 or Windows 10, probably that's an engineering workstation. So again, we want to get a good high level. Now, as you're going through the discovery process, you could find out other pieces of information that kind of fall in these other phases of the pen test methodology, right? You could start finding out, sure, information about that PLC. Oh, it's a Snyder um, uh, modicon. Here's the model number. Here's the firmware version, right? And, and you could even start finding, does it have any vulnerabilities, right? That's, you'd say that's technically in another phase of the methodology, but, um, or, oh, it's a Windows machine, and, oh, here's the domain name, and maybe I, I already, <laughs> I'm starting to collect, maybe I find usernames and, and passwords. Maybe I find a file share in the environment, and sitting there, and in there, there's a 
text file that has credentials. That's still a very common thing to find in IT and OT networks these days. But the idea is the more information we have, the more successful we're going to be. And you can see that last line is finding out about the network getting a good lay of the land. So then I can start to understand, well, how am I going to, if I needed to stay undetected as an attacker? Again, if I'm a pen tester, I'm not worrying about hiding my activity. I am as loud as possible. I want them to find me if they're looking, right? So they talk about, and they only have five different discovery techniques. Again, we're just doing high level kind of network mapping, really. And you can see doing things like network sniffing, wireless sniffing. So we covered those when we used, looked at Wireshark for helping build the asset register. Really, this that section we talked about, building the asset register, is a big part of what we're talking about here. So here's an example of network connection enumeration, right? Fancy name is saying, in its most basic form, if I'm on a, let's say I gain access to a Windows machine, like my laptop here, first thing I'm going to do probably is one of the first things I'm going to do, right? I'm going to log into the machine. Usually one thing we might type is like host name, right? What's the name of the machine? Ooh, laptop, new laptop, real imaginative. <laughs> or you might see like EWS1, right? Engineering Workstation 1, EWS2, EWS3. Another thing I would do is something like NetStat, or and there's different options. I might do like Netstat-NAO, long story, but you know the idea is what Netstat is going to show us is all of the connections that we have, not only active and you can see established with my machine. I can also see things like listening services on the machine, but here I can see well my machine at 10.2.1.252 and the different IP addresses that it's connecting and talking to. Now, of course, in this case. It's my home laptop. I'm connected to the internet, so I see lots of public IP addresses. Hopefully, in an OT environment, we're not seeing any public IP addresses. I just want to see internal IP addresses. So that would be something I could do. I could look for those connections. So when we talk about looking at enumerating network connections. This is where I kind of went down a rabbit hole, but I wanted to share with everybody because you remember earlier when we were doing the reconnaissance section and we were talking about using tools like Shodan and Google searches to find PLCs connected to the internet. Remember, there's this idea that we could find these Rockwell slash AB PLCs that were connected to the internet based off of, if we go back to, I never remember the page, but if we go to the Elite Wolf Project, remember the NSA released, it was that collection of snore intrusion detection sensors. If I go to the, the AB section and those Allen Bradley PLCs, they have a, a web interface that's exposed and it has all of these different pages. That one page that we're looking for is the one that shows all of the TCP connections. So if I take that, let's go back to Google, not Bing, not a, I'm just not a Bing fan. I just never have that great luck with it anyways. Oh, I think Bing actually filters out these searches anyways. So you can find all of these PLCs that are connected to the internet. And I can go ahead and open up any of these and you can see, oh, here's a PLC and we can see who's connected to it. Let me go ahead and blow that up a little bit. You can see they're connected on port 80, 44818, which is, so web server on port 80, which is where we're connected to. We're connecting from, and that's 71.85 address. That's, that's me. Now something's also connected over ethernet IP. So you can see 192.168.1.10, which is a internal IP address. And the PLC's internal IP address is 192.168.1.11. 
but its public IP address, of course, is the one that we see in the URL, the 63.45.172.189. So fast forward a second, I was trying to find one that had a lot more IP addresses to play with. I didn't find one that has too many, but here's an example that has a few. So this is where we talk about creating tools using ChatGPT. So I created this tool, this script, this Python script using ChatGPT. And so, and I create, I've been creating a bunch of tools <laughs> or scripts using ChatGPT, but I have this one, I just call it for now, PLC gather ideas that I launch it. And then I put in the URL of that page. All it's going to do is it's going to connect to the page. It's going to scrape it for any IP addresses. It's going to then tell me if it's a public IP address, where in the world it's located, right? And so it'll go ahead and you can see it connects to the page. It says, oh, we found these IP addresses. And so you can see one is coming from Marshall, Illinois. You can see, oh, the second one, 182.168, that's a private internal IP address. All right, so lots of private IP ad internal addresses. You can see Simpsonville, South Carolina, that's me. And then you can see there's also a IP address 166.246.162.18, which comes from, it's in Chicago. And the script will just check every minute. We can let it run just to see if anybody else connects. And over time, probably over an hour, you'll see like a couple people connect and you can just hit S to, to stop or just close the window. I think it's it's interesting, right, to watch like who's connected. So that's an example of how you can map out a network by using connections, right? TCP IP connections. Oh, look, somebody just connected. <laughs> Good timing. From Mountain Grove, Missouri. I uh, suspect that this is a PLC in the U.S. somewhere because all, all the addresses connecting to it are from the U.S. I do have an example of a different one in the... Um, I think the one in the slides was really interesting because you could see like all the connection, at least from a U.S. perspective, right? You could see China, China, right? Brussels, China. There's Simpsonville, South Carolina again, right? China, Taiwan. And then even while I was just sitting there, you know, within like five minutes, I saw there was the Amsterdam connection and then a Tehran connection, which is really interesting. Because usually a lot of like Chinese and Iran Iranian IPs, right? When you see those connections, it's like those those are straight from those machines. It's not usually like an attacker that's taken over that machine and they're using it as a proxy. Usually, right? It's that person sitting on that machine connecting. <laughs> so, so that's again, that's kind of a little my my interpretation of network connections, right? We can do netstat internally yes to, to map out the internal network but also this idea of you know, also using it externally and remember kind of what we were just looking at with that one online let me blow this one up remember, i'm outside on the internet i find this plc that's exposed to the internet and i can start to map out the internal network because look Remember the PLC, it has an internal IP address of 192.168.3.139. I know exactly what type of asset is. And I can also see it has connections from 192.168.3.141.142.143. There's a .140. So I know there's at least, what, five other internal assets? And again, it's like that Sudoku puzzle. So now that I know that the IP addresses are there, then I want to know well, what type of asset that is. Right? That's that, that whole point of, of building out those network connections and network discovery. So again, just another way of looking at, looking for network connections and mapping out different resources on the inside of the network. Now, We were mentioning earlier living off the land. So if I'm on a Windows machine, we can run Netstat, right? Or sometimes 
defenders can look for somebody running that stat. So you can, and then I, you can create something like in this case, I created a Python script to, you know, it seems like extra work, but you can call you can see internal underscore netstat.py. So it's a Python script that it looks, you run it on a Windows machine and it will, or, or, or Linux, it will find all of the, just the internal connections. And so you can see here in my home lab, I have, so 10.2.1 is my kind of the home, regular home Wi-Fi network. And then the, the uh, PLC lab or the OT lab, if you want, is the 192.168.100 network. And so in this case, you can see just by running Netstat from my, if you want, engineering workstation, I see, oh, okay, I have 10.2.1 is one subnet, and then I have 192.168.100. And that I see, oh, I'm connected to two different assets on that 192.168.100 lab, right? I see something at dot .100, that first line, and then I see something at dot .210. Now, a lot of these ports are just high order random ports, but I do see 44818, which is Ethernet IP. So that's a giveaway that there's some OT asset, like probably a PLC sitting there. And then I also see the only other port that I see here that's a giveaway for me is port 22, which I can connect to for SSH. So I just like to clean it up because if you run Netstat on the Windows box, you get so much of the local connections. It's like, I just want to see, or what I'm sorry, meaning is when you see the workstation will spin up a lot of connections where it's talking to itself. So you just see 127.0.0.1. Like that doesn't help me when I'm trying to build a map of the local network. So do a Netstat, but don't show me any, like if it's just, my machine talking to itself. That doesn't do me any good when I'm trying to build this connection. So it was have ChatGPT write a Python script to do Netstat, but take out all of the, the 127, you know, the, all that local host communication. Now we also talk about another option is remote system information discovery, which is and we've also started to really touch on. So this idea that, okay, I know there's IP addresses out there, but I want to find out more information, a little bit more information about those remote hosts. So remember, in this case, oh, I know there's a .100 out there, and there's oh, a .210. There's probably other hosts that are out there as well. So of course, the main tool that we use, even if I'm doing ICSOT, you know, pen testing and going up against maybe an ITOT DMZ, or let's say in a perfect world, wait, we can use Nmap. Oops, sorry. There. Oh, let me close that out. We don't need that. And so, and we talked about Nmap. Again, this is what we're really, really talking about in this section is building an asset register, right? We're just trying to map out the network and understand what's there. Well, remember, we knew from our Netstat earlier that there's a 192.168.100 network out there, which has a CIDR notation of dot zero slash 24. Now I can do things like maybe do that ping sweep to see are there, you know, are maybe there are other assets out there as well. In this case, we can see, oh, okay, I got one, two, three, four responses, right? So I see, oh, there's an asset at 100 at 200. Oh, and it's from Koyo Electronics, which if you're familiar, that's a click PLC. There's an asset at 210, the MAC address doesn't map into anything though at the moment, at least according to Nmap. So, but there's something at 210 and there's even, oh, it looks like there's a Siemens device at 220 and then there's the local host, which is dot 100, which is my you know engineering workstation slash 
home home laptop. <laughs> so the machine we're sitting on is 100.100. And then essentially there's three PLCs out there. There's another one, but it's not on the 192.168.100 network. Remember we looked at that and we caught it you looking at the Wireshark capture before and, and when we were building that asset register. But if I want to find out more information about these assets, right, and to save time, I went ahead and just took screenshots. And maybe I just do an end map across the environment, or in this case, just against a particular IP address. And I'm not just going to scan it for all 65,535 TCP ports, but just some of the common ones associated with IT and, and OT common services. You see here, like, FTP, SSH, Telnet, Web, right? S7, Encrypted Web, Modbus, Ethernet IP. And it comes back and shows, oh yeah, you have TCP 502 open and 44818. So Ethernet IP and, and Modbus. Now, Nmap also remember, gives us a lot of those service and script scans as well to do additional checks. So in this case, you can run them, though even just for those few ports, you can see that this scan took three minutes to run. Just on one PLC sitting right next to this laptop. Not an efficient use of time. We do what we have to. What you could do, though, since it's such a very limited number of ports, we can be very specific in what scripts we run. So like if I see 44818 Ethernet IP, well, I'm just going to run the script to enumerate Ethernet IP. So you can see, just run, don't run all of the Nmap, just generic scripts against the port. I'm just wasting time. But I know it's Ethernet IP. See, there's a script specifically called enip-info, Ethernet IP-info. And it, again, it was run here as part of all the scripts, but that took three minutes. If I run just the script for Ethernet IP, and see, it took a third of a second. And it gives me all this great information, right? It connects and says, hey, basically says, hey, tell me about yourself. And Ethernet IP, which is very, very talkative, you can see, comes back and says, oh, hey, I'm a PLC. Literally says, I'm a PLC. I am a Rockwell Automation slash Allen Bradley PLC. And here's my, my model number. Here's my serial number, just I don't know, in case you want to call support and you need help. Here's a product code. Here's the revision. So that's usually going to be the firmware version. So again, we want to look up to see, are there any vulnerabilities with this specific firmware? There's a status. There's also a state. The state is what's going to indicate the operational mode of that PLC. And then it even tells us, here's my IP address. Well, yeah, we already knew that. <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. There's a lot of great pieces of information that we have here. So not only, again, we started with an IP address, then we went to the ports, and then based off of those ports, we then, oh, we saw Ethernet IP, so let's run the script for Ethernet IP enumeration, and we got, hey, it's a PLC, it's the, here's the vendor, here's the model, here's the serial number, here's the firmware version. We even see the operational mode or operating mode of the PLC itself. So this means it's actually in run mode. That's where actually did a lot of my master's thesis work. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So we talk about there's discovery and collection, and we've kind of already blurred the lines. Discovery is just going out and finding, mostly it's just finding IP addresses, right? Or that there are assets out there for those assets that don't talk TCP IP. So you just have the idea that there's these assets out there. And maybe, again, things like IP addresses or MAC addresses. You don't necessarily know what they are, right? And then collection is more when you get into, especially those IT assets like PLCs, like we were just looking at, finding out more specific pieces of information, like what exactly is it? right? And then oh, even more specifically, yeah, the PLC is in red mode. That's collection. Right, so it's finding out more specific information from an OT perspective, right? Not just the fact that it's there's an asset there, 
right? That's the discovery part. Now we're getting into, I want more information about those. Right? If I you know, see some examples, right? If I see, oh, there's an HMI, like, can I get a screenshot of that HMI panel? Oh, it's an engineering workstation. Is like, can I, or a PLC, can I gain access to the PLC and its programming? Right? If I'm on a data historian, can I find process data? So it's, can I find all the OT specific information on that asset, whatever it is, wherever it is. And so they have, you can see a whole bunch of different techniques. And there's a couple that, I wanted to highlight, and this is probably a little bit self-serving because, again, this was a lot of what my master thesis was was done on, right? was this idea with PLCs. And the idea started with a lot of people don't understand the vulnerabilities associated with PLCs or the attack surface of PLCs, right? How are P PLCs vulnerable? So PLCs have what they call operating modes, some might only have two, some might have five or more. It gets gets a little crazy. But most PLCs you'll see usually think of have at least a run mode and something like program mode, or sometimes it's like stop mode. But the idea is you have run mode, and a lot of people think of run mode as read-only mode, which means that an attacker can't remotely manipulate the PLC. Now that's not always true. Like the PLCs that I've worked with, like most of them, if they're in run mode, no, you cannot upload firmware, which is good, right? Which which helps make them secure. But you could still make PLC programming changes like to the ladder logic. It'll actually ask you, it's like, oh, we're in run mode. Do you want to are you sure you want to make these changes? And you can say yes, and it'll it'll make those changes. So it's, run mode does not always mean read-only mode. So when people say, well, make sure that the key switch on the PLC is always in run mode because then it's secure. It's like, eh, not, again, not always true. Is it protected against upgrading or uploading malicious firmware? Probably yes. But it's not going to protect it from necessarily from PLC programming changes being made. So that's the idea, though. PLCs have this operating mode, run and program. So the idea is, yeah, if I need to make changes to the programming or upload firmware to do maintenance, right, I would put it, I would take it from run mode to program mode. And then I should put it back in, pro, in run mode when I'm done. So the general idea is if a PLC is in run mode, it should be considered more secure than when it's not. If a PLC comes out of run mode, then it's in a more vulnerable state, right? Where we could potentially upload something like malicious firmware. That's really, again, what we're talking about. Now, when I was going through the the kind of the research, and I got one of the click PLCs. This is the same PLC that they use in the SANS grid cores now. And it's also very common PLC you see in like manufacturing, a lot of, you know, smaller, medium sized environment, very like it's, you can get a fully loaded click PLC for like 400 us. And it is very functional. And, and you again, you see them in a lot of production environments. But the idea is that when you run their app, that to discover as, or it allows you to you know, discover any click PLCs out on the network. And so it goes out, it sends a packet, it sends a couple, we'll actually look at that in a minute, but, and then it gets a response back. So without sending any credentials or just to say, hey, are there any click PLCs out there? You can see in this case, there was a click PLC and it came back and said, hey, I'm here. Here's my IP address, my subnet mask, my part number, my version of firmware I'm running, my operational mode, my operating mode in this case, which I'm in run mode, my status is good, thumbs up. And here's my MAC address even. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. I just got all of that information just by saying, hey, are there any click PLCs out there? I didn't ask for it. I didn't run an Nmap script to enumerate it. It just gave it to me. So I was like, oh boy, this is going to be really easy because part of the thesis was, can I remotely enumerate the operational mode of the PLC? And in this case, it's already telling me, hey, I'm in run mode. <laughs> 
I'm like, yeah, this is going to be really easy because I was running Wireshark on the back end. So you can jump in, right? Wireshark is still a pen tester's best friend, even though most pen testers never touch it. And you could actually see these these six packets between my engineering workstation and the PLC. And if you look at them, we break them down. What it is, is the engineering workstation, right? It sends out that one request packet to say, hey, are there any click PLCs out there? It actually sends that three different times. So that's actually what we're seeing here. So it sends out the same packet three different times. And then the click plus PLC responds back and says, hey, here I am, here's my info. Here I am, here's my info. Hey, here I am, here's my info, right? The info that we're seeing here, and there's actually some even other pieces of information that it's sending back that you don't see. Which again, I found really interesting because like, oh, we already get this information. Again, it's even saying, hey, I'm in run mode. Or it can say, I'm in stop mode. And it can even say, oh, I'm in stop mode because somebody stopped me in the software or someone stopped me using a hardware switch. And so it was mapping out this process and this response. Here's the response we get, 512 bytes. And so I broke this down into, I think, 16 different unique fields that I could come up with. And I'm sure there's more research that you can do. KOP is an acronym, or it's, it basically stands for the German word for ladder logic. It's kind of like the initial opening kind of signature that I, that I saw for these, these packets, that when they send and receive, they all start with KOP. And you break it down into these different fields, and then eventually what you see is at the very, right before the very end, right, those two hex values represent whether it's in run mode or if it's in stop mode. And if it's in stop mode, was it placed in stop mode by the hardware switch or software switch? In this case, I see 0080, which means it's in stop mode and it's, Somebody actually flipped a little, it has a little uh, kind of like dip switch. It's not a physical key switch, right? These aren't that expensive models, <laughs> right? It's just a little dip switch. Some PLCs don't even have a, a physical switch at all. You only can take it out of run mode using software. So a lot of times when people talk about monitor the key switch position, that's great if your PLCs even have key switches, but really what we're monitoring is, is the PLC in run mode or not. That was, again, the whole thesis. So I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole. But again, it's detecting the operating mode of a PLC. That's actually a major technique in the MITRE ATT&CK framework. There's actually four different techniques around PLC operating modes in MITRE ATT&CK for ICS, believe it or not. That's how important it is. Because remember, when a PLC is not in run mode, it's more vulnerable than when it is. Okay, it's, some PLCs, it does actually re mean read-only and it can't be remotely hacked or manipulated. That's great. I haven't, I've, I, you know, and I've worked in environments that have those. But I think most smaller, medium-sized environments that implement, you know, we would say lower end or low cost PLCs, they're not going to have that option. They don't have a physical key switches. And even if they are in run mode, it doesn't mean you can't make changes to, to the PLC programming. So then the, the thesis kind of wraps up with this ability that if you have, or if you have PLCs, monitor for if they're in run mode or not. Because if a PLC comes out of run mode, again, if it comes out of run mode, it's more vulnerable than not, right? That's when we can at least, we can upload malicious firmware. Think of like Trisis, right? When the Russians took over the petrochemical facility in the Middle East, they uploaded malicious firmware to the controller. So if I ever see a PLC come out of run mode, I want to investigate. Now it's probably a technician doing work more than likely, right? But what if it's not? So again, just think it's it it doesn't make I think some people it doesn't necessarily sound important because like oh it's the PLC and it's a, but again there are four techniques in MITRE ATT&CK that all revolve around determining what the PLC operational mode is. Again, if a PLC is not in run mode, it's more vulnerable than not. 
So then, oh, what if I can upload malicious firmware as an attacker or as a pen tester? Usually, we're only doing that in lab environments, right? We're not doing that in production. All right. So, again, just to recap, right? Reconnaissance, we find out information about the environment to try to give us enough information to get that initial foothold, that initial access. Once we have that initial foothold, then we go into discovery mode. I want to map out the network. Really, and just get an idea of the assets that are there. Then we want to get more detailed information, especially around OT assets. That's collection. Now, execution, that kind of happens all the time. This where, but I did put it here in kind of my little roadmap. Right, the idea, because once you get more information, though, this is where we're really going to start a, making a lot of noise, right? And we're going to be taking a lot of steps to do things like gain access and take control over other assets in the environment, right? We're going to start moving past that initial foothold and doing the initial mapping. And that's really, to me, what execution is. And so that's where we're, you know, again, we're gaining access to maybe PLCs. And you can see the first technique, technique changed the operating mode of a PLC. So if I can connect to that PLC and it's in run mode, and I, okay, take it out of run mode, put it in program mode. Now in program mode, it could still be running and operating. So nobody would see an, like an availability or uptown issue, an uptime issue in the plant. But it would still allow me to change programming or maybe even upload malicious firmware. And then they get into, oh, you can use your command line interface to run commands. And you can connect to a host using a GUI, like through remote desktop. Yes. Now, I did want to mention, I think there's a great place, though, to talk about. You know, there's a couple of pen test distributions out there. Most people are familiar with Kali Linux. And that's the, the more, more popular pen test platform in, in IT. Now, there's also one created called controlthings.io. It's by um, oh, Justin Cyril, who is one of the SANS instructors. He was who I had for the GICSP course oh, 10 years ago. And he um, created this, I think, with a couple other folks. This hadn't, it hasn't been updated, I think, in two, maybe three years. But uh, it's kind of like a version of Kali specific to ICS OT. They get very detailed when looking at being able to do like hardware evaluations and those types of things, like stuff that I would never um, end up doing. So it's really interesting. It's just not getting type of work that I would do. But it's definitely kind of think of it as a OT specific Kali. Though I, I think most people like myself are just used to using Kali. So we want to maybe like add in OT related tools to Kali, and there and there are some there, but not tons. But but add things to Kali and use that as as the attack platform. I th I would say that's probably what most people do. But I do want to put control things out there as well because it is really interesting to look at and and say. I would say though again, it's probably more than what most like average OT pen testers use. But if you are an OT pen tester, let me know your thoughts. I, I'd be curious. Because again, I'm not a full-time or even a part-time OT pen tester in any stretch of the imagination. So, so I don't want to get too carried away with this section, but I think I've had a lot of lot of fun with using ChatGPT to create different scripts for either defensive or offensive capabilities, and I think there's a lot to be said using it in you have penetration testing these days, especially in, in OT. Uh, so whether it's ChatGPT or any of the other Gen AI platforms that you use to create scripts, uh, I just use ChatGPT and uh, MidJourney for the most part. So MidJourney is not going to be helping uh, necessarily in this case. But I, th I think the idea is if you can understand what you want the script to do, you can explain it to ChatGPT Ch and it can make it happen. Like, writing that script that would connect to that PLC page, right? Pull down the IP addresses 
and then also map them out to where in the world those IP addresses are based off of geo IP. Um, you know, it took probably, that was like one of the first scripts that I had chat GPT do, and it probably took like half an hour. And that was including having it tell me that, oh, you can use this service to do the geo IP lookup. You have to get, you know, you have to register and get a code. You put your code here. I mean, it was really I'm really quick. Um, there was an error message that popped up. I mentioned here, it's the really cool thing I think about ChatGPT is, you know, I am, I'm not a developer. I pretended to be one for a long time and I don't, it just, I could write code to a degree, but I was never great at it. I was horrible and hated troubleshooting. And so when you get error messages, you can just copy and paste it in ChatGPT and it'll say, oh, okay, here, here's your error message. Let me fix that for you. And it's like, here's the updated script. Uh, and it works. I mean, it's amazing. I've done it more than a few times. It's, it's really amazing. And so you can give it a prompt. Here, I actually can't, here's a prompt for, I think this was a description of how Pipe Dream works. When the, the open, like the framework I mentioned for OT, that's mostly off of, you know, living off the land techniques. I was like, oh, create a Python script to use the factory interface network service protocol to scan for and obtain MAC addresses associated with Omron devices. Now, I don't have any Omron devices, and actually do have one, but it does not have power. So I couldn't actually test it out. Um, but that's an, that's an idea of something, right, that, that you can use. Now, granted, depending on what your tool does i'm not using anything like creating anything earth shattering right um you should kind of determine whether it needs to be made available or not like i always go back to like so brian delpy who wrote mimi cats right that's something that when it was released that it's kind of like a nuclear bomb right in, in the, kind of like the Oppenheimer of the it world or the windows world where it was you know, there was so much, you know, so many bad things that came with that. Um, yeah, you know, so just kind of keep that in mind, depending on what you create with uh, ChatGPT. So here's an example where, and this is this is a very, just a simple example. See, please write a PowerShell script. Again, we don't want to do Python. We want to do PowerShell because we want to live off the land. That will ask the user for a specific IP address, right? Once you provide the IP address, the script should run a port scan on the following ports and report on any that appear to be open, right? And we give a list of common IT and OT ports. Only report on open ports, not closed ones. And so then it's like, oh, okay, well, to create a PowerShell script, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, here's your script. And you can click on, you know, copy code, and then you just save that out to text file. In this case, and then I have my IS, ICS underscore scanner dot PS1, and I run it. You see, it asked me for an IP address, just like I asked it to create the script to do. I give it that IP address of 192.168.1.200, and then it scans it for just those um, like 20 ports, and it says out of those 20 ports, oh, port 502 is open. So, oh, Modbus. You know, the nice thing is it it's PowerShell, and I can. It's not like I'm I'm, I'm using, or I am using built-in capabilities. I'm living off the land. I just happen to write a script in ChatGPT to do that rather than trying to, again, what if I download Nmap to do the same thing? If downloading Nmap, that could be detected. The presence of Nmap could be detected. So if we want to live off the land, then you, if I'm on a Windows box, I want to use PowerShell. And while I understand the basics of PowerShell, I'm not a PowerShell developer, and I don't want to spend three hours trying to research how to create this port scanner. It's, I'll just do it in literally 30 seconds or less using ChatGPT. So I did want to cover that just because I think it's very, very valuable. And obviously, just the power that's there is just only increasing exponentially every day. So there's a lot of options. And I've, again, I've had a lot of fun. I'm going to do a separate... Um, session on on just creating tools with chat GPT, chat GPT for for OT environments. So, anyways, all right. So that's execution. Now lateral movement. Where's the idea of being able to move from machine to machine, or 
when we talk about I want to move from you know IT into the IT OT DMZ, or once I get from I want to move from the IT OT DMZ into the OT network. Well, once I'm in the OT network, hopefully it's segmented into zones, right? Or at least you have kind of the idea of VLANs and restricted communication between assets. But if there's communication between zones, you know, we as pen testers or attackers could find that activity like just using things like Netstat, or maybe I can see network traffic using tools like Wireshark and see the communication. I can see those paths and be able to move into those systems and maybe gain access. And then it really comes to, well, what systems do I need access to? Well, that comes down to our objectives. If I'm just there for espionage, and I'm trying to steal the master formula and understand how the process works, right? How to, you know, what's the formula for this top secret uh, chemical and how is it made? I don't need control over every asset, like the SIS in the environment. I don't need the, the safety instrumented systems. But I do need access to things like data historians and HMIs and engineering workstations and PLC programming code, right? That I do need access to. Now, if I do want to have a much more physical impact like destruction, then we do need the SIS and PLCs and DCS and, and much more. But a lot of attackers that come into OT environments, right? It, a lot of it was was more espionage related. Of course, now these days it's all about ransomware operators getting into the environment and what type of impact that they, that they're going to have. All right, but that's the idea with lateral movement, right? We want to move from machine to machine. So in the full pen test course, right, there'll definitely be labs and exercises and in moving and using things like. But how about use PLCs as pivot points? Some PLCs actually run Linux, um, which is really interesting because then it's like a full attack platform in and of itself. So again, they talk about lateral movement techniques. So you can see using things like default credentials, you know, exploitation of remote service. So what if there is remote desktop or SSH there, right? Hard-coded credentials, right, that, you, oh, you know there's a username and password for, let's say, that PLC, right? It's hard-coded in there. It does not change. You can't even change it if you wanted to, right? So a lot of those techniques that you would take from the IT pen testing world, right, it's all the same concepts. Now, persistence we talk about, we're just going to highlight these real quickly. Remember, persistence is the idea of the attacker or us as pen testers being able to stay in the environment when we're found out. So persistence is not something that pen testers typically worry about. We're not, you know, it's, it's, we're not, not only we're typically trying to hide from being detected, but we're not worried about if we get detected about making sure we stay in the environment, right? Because the whole point is the client knows that they're there that were there. Now the security team, the operations team, if there is one, they might not know about us, right? Management might not have told us, hey, we're having a pen test to see do they detect the pen test and respond accordingly. But so persistence isn't something we normally worry about from a pen testing perspective. So we do have to understand, well, what if I compromise an asset? How do I stay on that box if it gets rebooted? Right? So if I am on a data historian what if that, and maybe I use Metasploit to get on it and I have um, an exploit running in memory, right? That gives me maybe a reverse shell to, to remotely control that host. But if the machine got rebooted, like maybe for a security update, then ooh, the code running in memory, my reverse shell goes poof. So how do we make sure that we were able to get that access back? So do I do something with maybe as something as simple as create a scheduled task to open up a, that, create that reverse shell, or maybe open up a backdoor listener? Right? Those, those, are, those are options. But what happens, you know, if I'm an attacker, think of, well, what happens if they, the defenders do discover me? What if they even kick me out from that one machine, from that one path? Do I have another path? Do I have other access into the environment? So things to think of. 
Um, so they mentioned different techniques for persistence. So yeah, again, if you have systems with hard-coded credentials that can't be changed, the only way to fix those is to replace those assets. And that's not necessarily always an easy thing to do, especially if it's like a maybe a, a PLC or a DCS, right? It's, you're not replacing those. Right? Being able to make changes, right? Uh, think of like with Trisys, right? Uploading uh, malicious firmware, right? Infecting project files. That's our, think of really for our programming for our, our PLCs. Or just again, going back and using valid accounts that you, you've stolen. And then there's evasion. So how do we hide from, from the defenses? How do we stay invisible? In an OT environments, was they say, you know, from the Dragos report, you know, it's about half environments have network security monitoring deployed, but then it's like how what percentage of those environments are even doing it effectively? And so how do we hide? And I always think of some of those examples, like I love the idea of taking control over a HMI running Windows. Because A, it's an environment that I can break into very quickly and get around and do lots of bad things with. But then if somebody's looking at it from a network perspective and they see that HMI maybe talking with a PLC, they just say, oh, it's an HMI talking with a PLC, and they don't think anything of it. Or even if they see an HMI maybe attacking other systems, it's kind of like in the IT world, if you see a printer and it looks like it has malicious activity going to other machines, you're like, oh, it's just a printer. Or it's just an HMI, so they just ignore it. All right. So um, what if somebody gets access to a data historian and installs maybe a backdoor listener like we were mentioning earlier? Would would you be able to detect it? Would you know that that's happening? Prob probably not in a lot of environments. What if somebody de de turns off, like maybe I'm running like Windows Defender on an engineering workstation. What if that gets turned off or whatever anti-malware solution they're using, right? What if that gets turned off? Are we monitoring for anti-malware software to, to be disabled or not? Right? What, do we, what do we see, you know, communication with the internet, right? Are we monitoring for that? What if there's a webcam? Maybe it did get, you know, some of those examples we saw with Shodan in previous section. What if it got exposed to the internet and it became compromised and it was used as that initial foothold? And maybe the first thing they do is just do a ping sweep of the entire OT network, which, which could happen. Those are just some examples, right? Are, and I, I know I'm talking about this more from a defender perspective, but I'm always kind of thinking it from both. If I'm an attacker, Right. I want to. How would the defenders watch for that type of activity and spot it? So, would the defenders be in place to watch, you know, and spot that activity? So, how would we hide? So, MITRE ATT&CK talks about, and here you see they're going back to talking about the operating mode, or I always say operational mode of the PLC. Again, this is one of those where. If an attacker changes, right, take it out of run mode, it's more vulnerable than not. So how do we hide, right? How do we hide our different, you know, our footprints, right? Or the crumbs that we leave when we gain access to these hosts, right? There's always evidence. What about event logs? Now, a lot of like OT assets might not have what we think of as true event logs. So there's not as many artifacts or crumbs, right, that we leave like we do in the IT world. So we have those. But, but ultimately, right, if it's more the end goal of the attacker, right, because this is, and this could be a penetration tester simulated in a lab environment. Like we were mentioning, where Dragos was simulating using Pipe Dream to create a like a water boiler to essentially overload and kind of quote unquote explode. But you want to do like real physical damage, right? That's where it comes down to you know what we're really impacting. I guess this is not MITRE ATT&CK. I should rename this slide. But this idea is you know there's loss of visibility, loss of control, loss of both. So this goes back to the very first part. Of the course we we're talking about remember stuxnet and when we talk about in ot the attacks really the the main goals are either loss of visibility loss of control or both right because what we're doing in ot is allows us right we we have an environment like a, let's just say a manufacturing facility 
and it manufactures, let's say, um, medicine, right? Like you're saying with, with insulin. And I want to be able to see, like with HMIs, different parts of the processes and make sure everything's working appropriately. I have visibility, right? And then if I need to, if there's an issue, an alert goes off, I need to be able to use that HMI to be able to make changes in the environment to address the alert. But what if an attacker comes in and takes away the visibility? Maybe it's just the screen goes away. Or in a more advanced situation, like with Stuxnet, remember the, the screen was there and everything looked good, but behind the scenes, everything was going to hell in a handbasket, to use a technical expression. So there was loss of visibility. We didn't even know something bad was going on. And loss of control. Can I, if I'm issuing commands, right, can I make those changes in the environment or not if I need to? So if we take away the ability for an operator to make changes in the environment when necessary. So go think about the Ukrainian blackouts, right? There was a loss of control. Right? Attackers came in, flipped the breakers, turned the, you know, right, turned the power off, and then wiped all the machines. So there was no control from the computer perspective, right? From the OT perspective, the only way to get quote unquote control back was to fall back to manual operations. So if it's, you know, ultimately, right, these attacks, these more destructive attacks are about loss of visibility and loss of control. If it's about you know, being able to gain access to the process and manipulate it. And they talk about a lot of fascinating, right, techniques. And some of these are things like denial of service. Maybe I just shut down part of the plant or even just keep thinking of that example where the guy on YouTube was using a flipper zero to take down the Wi-Fi. So all the CCTV cameras on Wi-Fi, all of a sudden they go black. There's the idea of, you know, the denial of service. But what if there's, you know, we're denying like the SIS, think of Trisis. Now that's the one denial of service attack that I would be concerned with more than anything. Right, talk about, yeah, alarm suppression. Remember, loss of control, loss of visibility, right? What if we're not having alarms triggered when they need to be? There you see, activate firmware update mode, right? Going back to the operational mode of PLCs. Are they in run mode or not? Are they in a mode where firmware can be updated and an attacker could upload malicious firmware? and so on and so forth, right? So a lot of interesting, right, techniques that they that they get into. This is where I was mentioning, I don't have the URL, but you can, I did include the, the name of the YouTube video. So this is from the 2015 Ukrainian power blackout, where again, this is where you would actually, this is the HMI, in one of those Ukrainian either power plants or transmission facilities. Maybe this was a transmission facility. And you can actually see the attacker has access to the engineering workstation running Windows XP, right, 2015. And then you can actually watch them try to you know, figure out how to turn off the, the, the power. And then remember, once they had the power turned off, they wiped the machines. So Windows XP no longer exists, right? That engineering workstation is just a brick. So definitely, if you haven't seen that, it's only like a minute and a half, but it's really interesting slash funny in a bad, good way. Watch how hackers took over a Ukrainian power station. Because it's, you can see it's like at least two, if not potentially more um, operators that are sitting there watching the mouse move on the screen and they're talking. It's like, maybe we should call IT. What if it is IT, right? It's just, it's really interesting that, you know, and that they had captured it on, on video. 
So definitely check that out if you haven't seen that. So I just wanted to include that. But overall, that's, I mean, the ICSOT pen testing methodology. And we did mention there's also kind of along the lines, there's command and control as well. So when I build the ICSOT, the pen testing course, the dedicated course, right, you can have different types of command and control, right? Because you can have command and control over the OT network from the internet, potentially. You could have just internal command and control. Or what about command and control of OT from IT or from the IT OT DMs. There's you know different variations. But remember with command and control, once you get that initial foothold, the idea is you want to be able to have that remote capability to be able to access that that foothold that you have. So most often, right, it's a, an attacker getting access to a machine in IT. And then that infected machine is talking with some host out on the internet that the attacker also has access to. So it's like that you know, that system in the middle. He's called man in the middle, you know, but kind of the intermediary host, right? That's just sitting there, and that the attacker has access to. The infected machine also connects to it and opens up that channel that allows the attacker to then issue commands as if they were sitting at the infected machine, and then they can use that. And this is where we simulate, right, most ICSOT pen tests is if I'm sitting in the IT environment at one of those hosts, do I have a route to get into the IT OT DMZ? And can I get from there into the OT network? Maybe there is no real true DMZ. Maybe there's just a firewall between IT and OT and it's filled with holes. Like, can I move through that? Right, so that's the most common type of you know, command and control, right, is we're controlling that IT asset from over the internet. Again, that's the most common ICSOT pen test that we're going to simulate. Now, folks at Dragos and, and other ICSOT researchers also look at you know, command and control channels through you know, industrial protocols like DMP3, OPC UA, and, and others, which are really interesting and, and fascinating. But is there a lot of real world applicability, right? That's nation states most most definitely could use that for things like staying in the environment and invading, right, detection. It's a lot of fascinating research. Probably not something most pen testers are going to worry about, though. But it's definitely a possibility. So I did want to, to throw it out there, right? So, and then, of course, they have the techniques in Meyer that they talk about, right? Commonly used poor. So going out, things like 8443 if you're in IT. What about looking at, you know, 502, like Modbus comment? What are those common OT ports that you would see, right? And then also look at the other ports and proxies. So, and that's kind of the overall, right? Reconnaissance, finding those routes into the environment, whether it's IT or OT or both, gaining that initial foothold. Again, more than likely, right, we're going to test. We're not going to probably get lucky and find an OT asset exposed to the internet, even though it does happen. And we looked at some of those examples. But what if, okay, we're going to you know, assume breach, right? We're going to start on the IT network, and then we're going to try to move into the IT, OT, DMZ, and then into the OT network. Right, there's discovery where we're mapping out the OT network. There's collection where we find more information about those different assets, especially the OT, you know, traditional OT assets like PLCs and HMIs and DCS. Right. Kind of along the lines or the idea there's there's execution, right? We're always running commands, but I think once we have the discovery collection information, that's where we're trying to do things like gain access to other systems, right? Lateral movement. Maybe that includes running exploits against target assets. Again, for most pen testers, we're not worried about persisting in the environment, right? We're not worried about hiding from intrusion detection capabilities or network security monitoring, right? But that is definitely part of, right, the, the attacker, methodology and then ultimately it's about are we able to gain access to the process and control and manipulate it right loss of visibility loss of control for the operators 
and then all along the line, right? There's there's probably some form of command and control um, if it's an attack, right? Not if we're a pen tester, probably. Pen tester, we were granted access, right? We don't have to worry about gaining access and some like reverse shell out to the internet to some intermediary box that we can use to to control that asset. But hopefully that kind of helps can at least it helps me look at the overall attack process from that kind of graphical perspective and it makes it i think for me makes miter attack make much more sense looking at it like this way than that big matrix that they have even though i appreciate all the work that they put into in making that matrix happen for sure so with that that is the official end of the course. So if you made it this far, I want to say thank you. Thank you for taking the time to go through the course. Again, if you have any questions, comments, concerns that come up, feel free to reach out. Best place usually is to get a hold of me on LinkedIn, but you can also find me at mike at mikeholcomb.com. Uh, all my resources are there. Uh, of course, the YouTube page, which you're watching this on, so don't really need to talk about that anymore. But again, thank you. Um, there is going to be an additional part. Again, if you want to go through the review questions just to kind of test your knowledge, definitely love to have you come back essentially for part 11. Uh, but as far as the course content, that's it. So thank you again. And uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Take care.